me start recording. Yeah. Okay. So that one thing that they are talking in this chapter is the evolution theory. The evolution theory. Um, it's also called uh, natural selection or evolution theory. Okay. Before I start with this selection theory, I also want to mention that uh, we as Muslims believe that all the organisms are created and designed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he created and he designed each and every organism with his, uh, with his unparalleled wisdom, right? And so we don't believe in chances. We don't believe in the fact that organisms came into existence all by themselves by chance. That is one point. Yeah, not there is no, there is nothing like chance. And these organisms did not come into being or their features did not come into being out of uh, just chance or coincidence. Okay, that is one thing that I would like to mention before we move on with this theory that this man, Charles Darwin, introduced i don't i will not talk about him too much because i don't agree with with his theory by the way he was an atheist so he came up with this and he also promoted atheism uh through this theory uh which is this darwin's theory of evolution it is called so uh, having said that you know being a muslim teacher it's my job to mention that before i start with this but because we have to follow the igcse curriculum and we have to follow this book and so uh yeah we have to follow and we have to study what uh, whatever he is saying in his theory but though his theory uh to some extent not completely to some extent makes sense uh it seems to make sense but um, on the other hand, whatever he's talking about is also happening with the permission of Allah. And Allah is the one behind uh, all of that, okay? Yes, this natural selection, you know, when we use the word natural, when we say a natural selection, what do we mean by natural? Or when we use the word mother nature, this term mother nature is very common these days. Who is mother nature? Is she some kind of mother or something? No, it's Allah. Okay, let's be honest. There is nothing as mother nature. It is Allah who is doing all of that. So having said that, let's get started with what he said, his theory. So uh, I'll just, first of all, uh, let's try to understand what is selection. So we are, we are studying selection. You get selected for something. You get selected for a job. You get selected for a university and so on and so forth. Selection means who is suitable for a job or who is suitable, who has the ability to survive or who has the ability to thrive uh, in a particular environment. So this is what we mean by selection. Selection is uh, how organisms are selected for their environment. The ones who are best suitable for their environment are the ones who are selected according to his theory, okay? So th that's where the word selection came from. Okay. <clears throat> then he explains, or his theory tries to explain, that, by the way, there are many other theories as well, but his theory got most famous. It got the most recognition. So he's trying to explain why organisms uh, vary in their features. Why do they vary in their appearance and in their features? Okay. And why some uh, organisms have vanished from the face of Earth? And why have new organisms appeared? So he has tried to um, answer these questions. Okay. So now they, this book has uh, divided his theory into these steps, five or six steps. Okay, you, you, uh, there, there is no particular sequence that you should know his theory in, but uh, I just made one, one sequence that made sense to me. So first of all, we have to understand that populations, since populations do not increase too much, 
there must be a reason behind it. Why don't the populations just boom all of a sudden? Because there is some competition, okay? The populations grow gradually over the passage of time. Why? Because according to his theory, it is because of competition, right? Because the organisms compete for resources, for food, for space, for shelter, for mates, and for uh, you know other things that they need for survival. And so some win the competition, and of course, some lose. Not everybody can win, right? And also we know that organisms vary slightly from one another within a population. By the way, what is a population? Does anybody remember the definition of population? What is a population? Any, what, what is a population? Does anybody remember? Sundas? Yeah, it's okay, not the exact definition. I don't want exact definition. What Whatever idea you might have. Just a vague idea. Even I don't remember the exact definition. Number of species in an area? Yeah, I think, yes, population is made up of similar species. Popular is uh, Population is made up of one species, and one species is what? Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I am Googling population definition okay, yeah. let's see yes you are right so this a population is defined as a group of individuals of the same species living and interbreeding within a given area so yes many species living together is called no 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 no, no sorry sorry I'll look away on this as a group of individuals of the same species living and interbreeding within a given area. Yeah, so organisms should be belonging to the same species and they should be living in the same area at the same time. That is called a population. Yes, like you have population of zebras or population of lions. So all the lions are lions. So they belong to the same species and they are living at the same time in the same area. So that's a population of lions. Like we are all humans we are living in one city and at the same time so we are a population of riyadh you can say so so organisms within population they vary slightly so overall they are the same overall they are the same but there are slight variations like all of all of us have alhamdulillah two eyes one nose mouth and two legs and two hands and so on and so forth but yes still we are all different we have different features, we are di different in heights and everything. Now, uh, some of these changes are more helpful than others. I mean, uh, talking in terms of the animal species, I'm not talking about the humans, but talking about the animal species, uh, uh, some variations are helpful for them. Okay, and we will study examples. So the ones which have those features, which are helpful features, they can, we can also call them advantageous features, are the ones who are better suited, who are more adapted uh, for their environment, who are more adapted to their environment, right? Now, the ones who are well adapted are the ones who win the competition. And so others, they lose the competition. By losing competition, I mean to say that they don't survive till adulthood, they don't reach adulthood. So when they don't reach adulthood, they cannot reproduce. And when they don't reproduce, they don't pass on their genes onto the next generation. So it is only the organisms which are well adapted, who succeed and who survive and who reach the adulthood and then they reproduce and hence they pass on their successful genes to the next generation. Right. This is also called the survival of the fittest, that only the well adapted organisms survive. Okay. And then the second step is overproduction. These well adapted organisms, 
which have survived, they reach adulthood and therefore they produce offsprings and then they pass on the alleles for the advantageous characteristics onto their offsprings. And so that is how uh, during a pass, I mean, after a passage of time, after some, some years or so, you will see that the population has those advantageous characteristics only and they lose those uh, disadvantageous features. They don't have the other features with the passage of time. Okay, the poorly adapted. So with the passage of time, the poorly adapted characteristics are gone from the population or those organisms are gone from the population. So it is only the best adapted organisms which succeed in passing on their characteristics to the next, next generation. Uh, okay, so that was that. So this was the only thing that needed explanation in this whole chapter. And the rest of the chapter is the application of this theory, the examples of this theory, that's all. And then they have introduced uh, two more uh, terms, selection pressure and stabilizing something, what was it? Stabilizing selection, right? Those were the two. Okay, let's move on to the example. So if you have understood this, is there any question? Well, if you want, you can ask a lot of questions regarding this theory. Many scientists uh, argued about this theory, but for now, we will just follow the book. This is one example which is given in your book of cacti. Now this is one population. All of them are cacti. All of them are living in one area at the same time. So now the first picture is showing us that now they both are cacti, but they vary in the length of their roots. This cactus has longer, deeper roots compared to this one. And so, I mean, this is natural, natural meaning from Allah, right? So, but then, um, so this long root cactus will reproduce initially, this one will also reproduce. But when there is time of drought, meaning absence of rain, there is no rain, lack of rain, then it, these will die of dehydration because their roots are not reaching deep enough. And so they cannot uh, reach to the water. Also remember the desert, water is very deep why because yeah because you know the sand is very um the sand is very fine and porous and so the water trickles deep into the deeper layers and also it doesn't drain that frequently so that the surface the level of water never rises too high and so only the plants with deeper roots are successful in such a habitat. So these one, because they died of dehydration, they never got a chance to uh, reproduce. And at the end, all you're left behind with is our cacti with only long roots. Okay, these are all cacti. So only these left behind, they reproduced. And so they had kids like themselves, offsprings like themselves. So they so, th so this is an example of passing on successful genes to their offsprings. So they had genes for deeper, longer roots, okay? Then this is another example of wild beast, beast uh, yeah, wild beast. Okay, so they are al also competing. Also remember the predators like lions and all the other pre predators, they prefer um, animals who are a little, weak or some or injured maybe yeah or or maybe limping or maybe injured somehow so it is usually the injured it is usually the weaker of the whole of the whole herd who becomes the target of the predator so survival of the fittest okay Okay, now another example. Yeah, this example they discussed in detail. This is of moth. 
Now, they are saying that in Britain, there are two types of moth. One is this black, and the other is this with the speckled wings. Now, this is due to a mutation, according to this book. This is due to a mutation. What's a mutation? Yes, Myra, yes. A change in the gene. Right, very good, perfect, yes. Change in a gene, change in this base sequence of the DNA, which will then code for a different protein, different amino acid, and proteins have their uh, properties due to the sequence of the amino acids, right? So if, if, even if you change one amino acid, it's gonna change the property of the whole protein. So a, a mutation like that, so there must be some base sequence uh, coding for this speckled appearance. And so there must be some change in the base sequence and therefore a, a change in the amino acid. And therefore now they are now synthesizing black pigment or something which is giving them the dark color so this is due to mutation now mutations according to science takes place randomly uh, meaning by chance okay because you see science cannot explain everything there's a limit to science okay from there i mean our thinking stops there so we don't believe that mutation is just by chance. That mutation is also brought about by Allah. I mean, Allah changed that sequence, right? Because Allah wanted a different appearance, maybe. So yes, maybe to help them, to help these moths, okay? So now the story here is that because of this mutation, so because they, they say that, you know, mutations are random. And so uh, we have both types of moth, but some habitats support this and the other habitat supports this black moth. Yeah, okay, come. In number, so these moths are also increasing in number because they can uh, easily be better camouflage. Okay, and then the dark moths they show up a lot, so the birds can eat them, and so they decrease in population. Yes, yes, you are right. Yes, so uh, the so uh, before pollution, before the industrial revolution, industrial revolution they, is that era uh, in which these Western the the, Euro, the European countries. They industrialized, right? So before the industrial revolution, when there was no pollution, it was um, a lichen. There, there were a lot of lichen growing on the bark of trees. By the way, lichen is a yeah, lichen is a combination of fungus and uh, one more thing, and that grows on the uh, bark of trees. And its appearance is very much similar to the speckled wings of these moths, and therefore there is very good camouflage. And so uh, uh, they they survive, and so they reach adulthood, and they produce offsprings, and therefore they pass on the genes of their speckled wings onto their offsprings, right? Whereas this black moth shows up, and therefore it never gets a chance to reach the adulthood because mostly it is uh, eaten by the birds. Now, what they're showing in this map here is that the wind direction is from the Atlantic Ocean. You know, there's Atlantic Ocean on this side of, Brit of Britain. And so the polluted air is pushed towards the eastern side of Britain. Okay, so you have more uh, uh, pollution on the west side of UK. And um, they, and also they have more industrialized city on the west, towards the west of UK. And so these, this part is more polluted and therefore you will see more black colored moth here on the west side of UK compared to the east side of UK. In, on, on the east side of UK, you have more speckled moths. Okay, why? Because lichen is growing more here. Also remember lichen uh, does not grow uh, or pol pollution inhibits the growth of lichen because pollution also kills lichen. You can think of it that way. And so you won't have a lot of lichen growing towards the 
east of you here. Okay, so you, you have a black on the east side and you have a speckle on the west side, right? This is all they are saying. Um, okay. Then let's look at this. So this is an investigation, like sort of an experiment investigation that they ca carried out. Uh, they took equal numbers of speckled and black colored moths. Okay. And they also mark them with a spot under their wings, maybe to so that they can, um, yeah, so that they can collect them later on and also find out if the moth have produced more offsprings or is it the same moth or is it the parent moth, you know? Okay, so they introduced each type equal numbers of speckled and dark moths on both types of on both types of forests, you can say, or woods. This is polluted one. This is, oh, sorry. This is polluted one, and this is unpolluted wood, right? And then after a few days, they collected the moths, and they did not mention if they were the marked ones or were they the offsprings. Let me show the whole picture like this. So in the polluted wood, you, you had more black and less speckled, though they introduced equal number. Why? Because they got eaten by the birds because they did not get camouflaged. Here, they were camouflaged more. And so we had more speckled compared to dark, though they had introduced equal numbers of moth in both the types of wood. Okay, and they used a light trap because these moths get attracted towards light, so it's easier to catch them. Um, so yeah, this was the investigation. Is there any question so far? Okay. okay. Now they're talking about selection pressure. This is a term they have, uh, this is a vocabulary word that you should know the definition of. The factor which confers an advantage on the dark moths and a disadvantage on the pale moths in polluted areas is predation by birds, okay? What is that factor from the environment which is, uh, which is causing the change in the future? That factor of the environment, that environmental factor is called the selection pressure. For example, in this example, what is the selection pressure in this example? It is, it is because the birds are predating, preying, sorry. The birds are preying on the moths. So that's a selection pressure here. Okay, so selection pressure is that environmental factor which is causing the selection in the organism. You can think of it that way, which is causing that selects the dark moths for survival. Okay, now then there is another example. They're discussing antibiotic resistance in bacteria. Now, bacteria is also an example of a population, same species living in uh, the same area and same time. Okay. Um, now, how does penicillin work? Penicillin works by inhibiting the synthesis of cell wall of bacteria. Now, bacteria cell wall is not the same as the plant cell wall. There is some difference. It is made up of a different uh, substance. It is not made up of cellulose. And so what penicillin does is that it inhibits the synthesis. Synthesis means making of that cell wall. Now, when bacteria don't have that cell wall, then it is very easy to uh, kill those bacteria by the antibodies or by even uh, enzymes, okay? So if you have a bacteria which is without a cell wall and then you have a bacteria which is with a cell wall, this cell wall protects this bacteria. This cell wall protects the bacteria, okay? Penicillin, most of the anti... Uh, not most of the antibiotics, but the 
the first line antibiotic first lining meaning when anybody is started on antibiotic the drug that we start with is penicillin that's the simplest commonest uh, used antibiotic so what that penicillin does is that it it hampers with the protein synthesizing machinery inside the cell and it inhibits it from making this cell wall so when you give penicillin the bacteria are like this without cell wall and so now it's easy for the enzymes and for uh, the antibodies and the defense mechanism of the body to deal with this they can easily kill them right that's how antibiotics work so once you know this now if any bacteria by some mutation or by in any way has gotten a gene that will resist the penicillin meaning that their protein something happened inside some changes some some changes took place inside now penicillin can no longer inhibit now the penicillin can no longer inhibit the protein synthesizing machinery and the bacteria keeps making its cell wall even though the you are giving penicillin but bacteria can still make their penicillin and there is and they are constantly multiplying reproducing increasing in number though you are treating the patient with penicillin so why is that this is called resistance this is called the bacteria has grown resistant to penicillin this is also one of the features now this mutation therefore is giving advantage it's an advantageous feature for uh the bacteria okay so that's an advantageous feature for the bacteria and so the rest of the bacteria which are not resistant they will be easily killed by the uh, body's defense mechanism and only the resistant one will survive so survival of the fittest this gene got advantageous and so it is the only one left behind and of course then it will multiply and it will pass on its gene to the rest of the uh, offsprings and so now we have all resistant bacteria so now treating such a patient is very very difficult because now you have to treat this patient with something else the bacteria now knows how to deal with penicillin no you know you can no longer uh, use penicillin it's not effective you have to change your penicillin i mean sorry you have to change your antibiotic you have to use some other antibiotic Okay, one example of such resistant bacteria is Staphylococcus aureus, and it is usually found in hospitals. It is called methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. Why is MRSA more common in hospitals? So, before you answer that, what is the selection pressure here? What is that one environmental factor which is causing the selection? The antibiotic. Yes, the antibiotic. Yes, the antibiotic is the selection pressure. And so uh, now answer this question. Why will you find more of the, these resistant bacteria in hospitals? Louder. Yes, so the more selection pressure you exert, the more select, the more organisms are pressurized um, to have that gene for their survival, right? So in hospitals, we have different types of patients on different medicines, right? And so the bacteria there are resistant to all of them. I mean, not all of them, but most of them. And so you usually you will find more um, you you usually you will find or uh, uh, infections or bacteria found in hospitals to be resistant because they are already exposed because they are exposed they already have that they know how to deal with these antibiotics and so therefore un going to the hospitals unnecessarily is not recommended secondly. Um, I was about to say something and I forgot. 
okay. Yes. Another thing is that's the reason why uh, in Western countries, especially, they don't uh, recommend starting an antibiotic when you have a sore throat, at least for the first uh, week or so, for the first week or so, or for the first 10 days, they do not recommend starting antibiotic. Why? Because they are waiting for the virus, because most of these sore throats are viral infections. And so the virus, I mean, we don't give antivirals for viral infections. We Virals are self-limiting, self-limiting meaning that they will complete their life cycle and then they will go away. I mean, they will die off, right? And so you, you will uh, recover from that infection. They don't want antibiotic resistance in any uh, bacteria. Okay, because when you are having a viral infection, that is also a very good breeding place for bacteria. And if you are taking antibiotic unnecessarily, initially there was no bacteria, initially there was only virus, but because you took antibiotic, now if there's any slight exposure to bacteria from the environment, that bacteria might develop resistance to that antibiotic, and then it will multiply and then you will have a resistant bacterial infection. That will be a worse problem. Therefore, they discourage using too many antibiotics, okay? See, if antibiotics are used too often, we may end up with resistant strains of bacteria that are very difficult to control because we don't have many different types of antibiotics, okay? You have, I think, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think we have two to three different lines or maybe four or maybe five at the most, not more than that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, then, it's, it's, you want me to add a little about antibiotics? Yes, yes, sure. Yes. Yes, oh, yes oh, sure. Yeah, it's a nice, very nice discussion. I really like it. Uh, since this is our field as well, we teach to our medical students. So first of all, you talked about penicillin. Penicillin is a group of antibiotic. Everybody heard about amoxicillin, ampicillin, cloxacillin, methicillin. These all are the members. So penicillin is a wide group. You have maybe 20 into a different group, different members of penicillin group. So they are called cell wall synthesis inhibitor. They are damaging the cell wall of bacteria. As you rightly mentioned that uh, bacteria definitely need cell wall to be stronger. What penicillin does, first of all, keep in mind that penicillin chemical structure, we do call it beta lactam antibiotic. Beta lactam is the integral part of this uh, structure of penicillin. If beta lactam is lost due to any reason damage, penicillin is not working. So bacteria like step aureus, you mentioned Staphylococcus aureus, which is present on your skin, which is present in norm normal flora. And this is how most probably implicated in acne that we have. And when you have cut I mean, on your skin, there's how pus formation is formed and it's infecting the wound on which is present on your skin. That is Staphylococcus aureus. Staph aureus is producing one enzyme, which is a defense mechanism. Uh, this is how we call it resistance, beta lictimase. Beta lictimase means it's uh, damaging the beta lictim ring of penicillin. So there's why penicillin cannot work in the presence of beta lictimase. This is one defense mechanism. As you mentioned, if you frequently use antibiotic, penicillin is the most common. We have 20 different classes of antibiotics available these days amoxicillin and we have penicillin, cephalosporins, aminoglycosides, so on and so forth. There are so many which is not in, uh, I think, in your curriculum. But what you need to know about these methicillin and penicillin mechanism and resistance. Resistance is through beta lectin, uh, 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 beta lectimase enzyme, which is damaging the beta lectin ring of penicillin structure. So in the presence of that enzyme, it cannot work. That is why what we do, augmentin. Augmentin has got, I think everybody heard about that, is a penicillin combined with a beta lactamase inhibitor. We have separate compound that can inhibit the beta lactamase enzyme, which is produced by bacteria. So in that case, uh, those antibiotic even uh, uh, will be effective against those bacteria that are resistant to penicillin alone. So you cannot use, you use penicillin alone but you can combine with beta lactamase. So coming to the mechanism again, that a cell wall uh, of bacteria need a very uh, fine uh, cross-linking. 
uh, mesh formation or networking or cross-linking. If this cross-linking is damaged by penicillin because penicillin is inhibiting the enzyme responsible for cross-linking of the cell wall of bacteria. So if cell wall is not there, in, uh, internal environment of bacteria is hypertonic. So the solution from outside you know, will go, get in and bacteria will burst. So it cannot survive without cell wall, okay? And then you mentioned about MRSA. MRSA is a methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. This methicillin is a group of penicillin. This is very common in problematic bug in hospitally acquired, especially pneumonia, for example. And even in some cases you have uh, GIT infections. So due to this stiff aureus, which is methicillin resistance, hardly any antibiotic would work. And that's why they are using special antibiotic, okay? Uh, there's vancomycin, we call it vancomycin, which is totally different from penicillin. And then you so on and so forth, you have lots of other information. If you have any question, I yes. can answer that right now, or otherwise I, I'm sure I, I think I did something that probably yes. you understand. Yes, uh, yes, Jazakallah khairan. Okay, welcome. Okay. okay, okay. Now the next topic is stabilizing selection. Okay, now as the name suggests, again we are selecting an organism, uh, so so that it best best suits its its environment. But it is a stabilizing. Stabilizing meaning that it does not allow the population to. Um, sorry, it does not allow too much change in the adaptive features. I mean, it does not allow too much change. Like, you know, you will not see one species changing into another species, right? Natural selection, remember, occurs only if the environment changes somehow or if there is some mutation that appears uh, within the organism and which is adapting the organism to its environment in a better way. Only then um, the population will uh, I mean, adapt that mutation, will take that mutation and uh, will take that adaptive feature, okay? So uh, you can think of a stabilizing selection as preventing too much change, okay? If environment stays the same, there is no need to have further features and natural selection keeps the population same from generation to generation. If organism is well adapted and the environment also stays the same, the organism will not evolve. That only happens if there is some change in the environment or if there is some mutation. Example is this, they have given this example. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this organism's name correctly. Coelacanths, which live deep in the Indian Ocean have existed almost unchanged for 350 million years. Humans have existed for only about 4 million years. So because this, um, it's a habitat, which is the a bed of the Indian Ocean is pretty stable, therefore, and it is best, it is uh, suited well for its habitat, therefore it doesn't need to evolve, it doesn't need to change, okay? This is what we mean by stabilizing selection. Okay, is there any question? And then another example they gave is that in the southwest of Britain, the environment of the peppered moth has never changed. Okay, let's move on. Okay, now this example of sickle cell anemia. Okay, in order to understand, you should have a background of what sickle cell anemia is. Any idea? Sundas, any idea regarding sickle cell anemia? Yes, the red blood cells acquire a sickle cell shape. And why is that? Because, again, there is a mutation in the gene. Does anybody want to answer? Just rough, brief. Come on, guys, participate a little. Okay, so there's a uh, mutation in the gene, uh, in that gene, which is coding for hemoglobin. Remember what hemoglobin was? Now don't stay quiet on this question. What is hemoglobin? Sundas, you tell me, what is hemoglobin? 
It is a protein, yes. Very good, yes. Transportation of oxygen and also carbon dioxide. Okay, so if there is some mutation in that gene, um, which is coding for hemoglobin, then the hemoglobin does not have its regular shape. The regular shape of hemoglobin is, you can Google search, there are very good pictures of hemoglobin, but it is something like, you know, you know, like it's a big polypeptide chain, which is crumpled up into this shape. Okay, and then you have heme groups, like you can think of heme groups as four seating, uh, seats, four seats on which the oxygen sits, on which one oxygen sits on one heme. One oxygen sits on one heme. There are four seats. You can think of this as a car with four seats. So four molecules of oxygen can sit in one hemoglobin. This whole thing is one hemoglobin. Okay, one oxygen molecule can sit on one seat. Now, when there is mutation in the protein, uh, in the gene that is coding for this protein, it loses this shape and it, it, it is in, I don't know the exact shape, but it is in the fibrous, fibrous forms, in the long, long strands. So it's no longer globular. It's no longer crumpled up this way, but this is the normal shape. This is how it works well if, when it is in this shape. If it is in the form of long strands, it doesn't have the heme, and even if there are heme, they, the oxygen molecules cannot sit on them as the transport of oxygen is affected. It is not efficient enough. Okay, and because of these long fibers, even the shape of the red blood cell is affected. So the, the shape of the red blood cell is no longer biconcave, which is normal, but it is like sickle. Like this, okay? like a sickle. Have you seen a sickle? Sickle is a farmer's tool, which they use for um, digging in the soil, for softening the soil, right? So the shape is like sickle and therefore there it's, it's called sickle cell anemia, okay? Now the gene which gets mutated and which leads to this problem, they it's uh, it's co-dominant. Now, this dominance, co-dominance, this was this you must have studied in your genetic, in your hereditary chapter, which I did not take, which I did not teach. But uh, co-dominance means, see, you have dominance, then you have recessive, and then you have co-dominant, right? What what is the dominant gene? Can anybody recap real quick? In simple words, you don't have to give me exact definition. Dominant. What is the dominant gene? Yes, Myra, Ajwa. Its effect is expressed. Very alone. good. Yes. So even if it is single, its effect is expressed in the in the phenotype, right? Phenotype is the appearance. The genotype is what genes are there, what alleles are there, right? So the gene which gets mu a mutant and which leads to this problem is co-dominant, meaning that if, for example, we will use the symbol. So we can use these symbols. This We'll understand the symbols. This is normal hemoglobin, and then this is this is sickle shape. This is sickle cell anemia. Okay. Now dominant means that even if you have one gene of sickle cell anemia, that person would suffer with sickle cell anemia, even if he has one. Remember, we have genes in pairs, also from that genetic chapter. Also remember that we have genes in the form of pairs, right? So um, if it is dominant, then even a person who has this, whose genotype is this, will suffer with sickle cell anemia, but that's not the case. Um, the sickle cell gene is co-dominant. Co-dominant meaning that if a person is heterozygous, what does heterozygous mean? 
that one gene is coding for sickle cell anemia, the other is normal. So he got normal from one parent, the other, the other sickle cell uh, gene he got from the other parent, right? Remember in these pairs of genes, one is for from each parent, okay? This patient will have few red blood cells normal, uh, sorry, few hemoglobin normal and few red blood cells normal and few uh, red blood cells sickle celled or few hemoglobin sickle. So it will have both. It will have normal as well as abnormal. So it will have like 50% normal, 50% abnormal. This is called co-dominance when both the genes express themselves in the phenotype. This is called co-dominance. Why do we call it co-dominance? Because both of them are expressing themselves equally in the phenotype. That's why we say both of them are dominant. So we say co-dominance. Did you understand? Because both of them are expressing themselves in the phenotype. That's why they are called co-dominance. So sickle cell mutant gene is co-dominant. Okay, remember that. Now, what they are saying here is that uh, so people who are homozygous, homozygous meaning both the genes were abnormal, they never reach the adulthood. They die before adulthood. And so this genotype is uh, fortunately not passed on to the offsprings and normal. And then the selection pressure here is exerted by malaria. Malaria is the one that exerts a selection pressure. Why? Because uh, the people with normal hemoglobin, they suffer with malaria. And in, in olden times, they did not have uh, the treatment for malaria and many of them would die. Okay, but the ones with this mixed type, co-dominant uh, genotype, they were the survivors. So this turned out to be advantageous for them because the abnormal hemoglobin would, was resistant to malaria. The, the abnormal cells were resistant to malaria because of which they would survive better, the mixed ones, okay? And so because of this selection pressure, we have this genotype in our population. Okay, and so this is passed on to the next generation. Okay, um, another thing, uh, yeah, other, uh, okay. Sickle cell anemia, by the way, they also mentioned the symptoms that uh, because of the abnormal shape of the red blood cells, there is not efficient um, a transport of oxygen and therefore these organs especially are affected because why? because these organs are the ones which have high oxygen demand. They cannot do uh, without oxygen. They cannot do with less oxygen. Less oxygen is not enough for them. Kidneys, liver, eyes, and heart, okay? Um, yeah, that's the, that's the story. They are malaria, okay. Yeah, see, people homozygous for the sickle cell allele often died early from sickle cell disease, people and then the people who were homozygous for the normal alley also died from malaria. So people who are homozygous with the sickle cell, they died of sickle cell anemia. People who were normal died of malaria. These were the advantageous people, these, okay? This is what they're saying. And in some parts of the world where ma malaria was present, people with the heterozygous genotype were most likely to survive until they were old enough to reproduce. Mm. Okay, so that's all. Okay, now selective breeding. Selective breeding, what does selective breeding means? That you make organisms which have, uh, which have desired features to breed with each other and you do not allow the organisms which have the undesired uh, features to mate with each other so that you only get the desired features in their offsprings. And so humans 
we are selfish, right? So we don't allow the organisms which have the unwanted or undesired features to have offspring. And so we only uh, breed the uh, organisms which have the desired features. For example, in case of cow, we want high yield milk. So only this, that species of cow or that cow which gives a lot of milk will be allowed to breed. The others will not be allowed to breed. A breed, okay? This is called, you can call it um, artificial selection, right? This is called artificial selection. Um, and then now these days they are saying that uh, instead of yield, they are uh, looking for less uh, low maintenance animals, easy care characteristics animals, animals that require less uh, care and they are easy and cheaper economical to keep. Um, and then, okay, this is called artificial, the breed is really the one with the characteristics, okay. That was all, I think there's, it's not too hard to understand, right? Okay, now let's move on to the questions. Using the six points listed on page 253, explain why the proportion of dark peppered moths near Manchester in Britain increased at the end of the 19th century. Anybody wants to make a guess using the six points listed on page 253, explain why the proportion of dark peppered moths near Manchester in Britain increased at the end of the 19th century. Any guesses? Yeah, kuch to bolo. Listen, if you will not participate, then I will also not take these classes. Do you know how difficult it is for me to take these classes? Uh, who, is, who is this, Abdul Rahman? Who is this? Yes. Okay, using the six points listed on. Okay, the six points, you know what six points they are talking about? They're talking about the same six points that we discussed. So I'll show you from your book. I think you guys know this, know this already, right? You know the answers, you know everything. Listen, if you guys will not respond to me, then I am telling you I won't take any more classes. I think you are well off without me. These are the six points they're talking about. Variation, because then you know, how will I know if you are listening to me or not? Variation, struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, advantageous characteristics, gradual change. So how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so how will you explain, how will you fit in that moth story here? Fit in the moth story here. So you will say that most populations of moth, um, most populations of moth are, um, are uh, you know, they are dark as well as a speckled. So we have both types in the population, right? And so in the 19th century, what happened? Industrial revolution, right? And so there were a lot of industries and so the environment got polluted because of which, uh, because of which the black moth was better camouflaged against the suit deposited on the bark of the trees. And so they were the ones who survived till adulthood, right? So same story, but fit in the moth story into this. Are you getting me? Okay, same six points, but you fit in the moth story into this. And then struggle for existence. Okay, so you will say, say that there was considerable competition between the speckled and the black moths uh, but 
the, uh, the black moth because of its color and better camouflaging was more better, uh, sorry, was better adapted to the polluted, to the new polluted environment and therefore it will serve, it survived better. And then same thing. And so the only uh, well, because only the well adapted organism survived. So it was the only one that survived and reproduced successfully. And then over a period of time, we only had the black moths and the speckled moths vanished. That's it. Okay, six points. Okay, you just fit in. Are you getting me? At least say yes or no. Yes, miss. Jazakallahu yes. khairan. uh honestly tell me you guys didn't know this i i mean you you didn't you really faced problem with this chapter did this class help you yes you really mean it yes because in school the uh, answer doesn't wait for like uh, he, he didn't explain like, this way or he didn't explain uh, it at all uh just let it go it's being recorded, so I don't want to like uh, say anything he, about it. He just read it, ma'am. The class is being recorded, so I don't. I, yeah, I, okay. I just want to keep it confidential. Oh, okay, okay, okay. No, no, I did not ask that. I was just asking that you really needed help in this, right? Because you know, you guys are not responding to me, so I have no idea how much. How much are you benefiting from me? How much am I helping? That's that's what I was trying to ask. But that's fine. But yes, if I if it is helping you, I'm happy. Because that's that's why I'm here. Okay, why is it unwise to use antibiotics unnecessarily? We just discussed it. So can you summarize it? Why is it unwise to use antibiotics? Sundus? Josefa? Yes, okay, Myra. The excess use of antibiotics uh, allow the bacteria to become more resistant towards it. Therefore, it would yeah. have no effect on it. Yes. Yes. So it will. Uh, so uh, antibiotic is acting as a selection pressure, right? And so um, uh, any mutation in the population that will make the bacteria resistant to antibiotic will be advantageous. And so that will that organism will be the only one uh, reproducing successfully and passing on its resistant gene, gene for resistance to its offsprings. And the rest of them will, so that will lead to antibiotic resistance, okay? What is meant by stabilizing selection? Give one example. Stabilizing selection, I told you, is a, It is preventing too much change in a population. Like you don't see one species turning into another, right? Fish remains fish. A, a goat will stay a goat, right? We have different types of goat, but goat will not turn into some other animal. You will not, it, it, it won't change to that extent. That is because Changes in organisms take place only according to the uh, environment. If the environment is the same, and if the organism is well suited to its environment, then there is no need for change, okay? I don't know its exact definition. They have not mentioned any exact definition here, stabilizing selection. Mm. Is it there in the glossary at the back, stabilizing selection? Okay, what, what is the answer to this question at the back? Sundos? Can you get me the answer to this question from the back? 19.6. Okay, this is the answer. Stabilizing, so yeah, you can, you can mark it as the definition for your stabilizing selection. This is selection that maintains the same characteristics in a population, okay? Stabilizing selection is a selection that maintains the same characteristics in a population 
if the individuals in that population are already well adapted to the conditions in which they live, there are many examples, for example, the coelacanth. Okay, so there are two things. If the individuals are already well adapted, and secondly, the environment is not changing, there is no need. And that's what selection pressure says. I think if you say it in your own words, that will be fine. Okay, example is coelacanth. You can find more examples from Google if you want. Okay, draw a genetic diagram to show how two heterozygous patients, uh, parents can have a child with sickle cell anemia. Okay. Two heterozygous parents, right? So two. Okay, there are two ways of making uh, this genetic diagram. I, okay, let me draw the one that I am used to. But what I do is this I take one gene from one. So this is one parent, this is another parent. Both of them are heterozygous. That's what they said, right? In the question, heterozygous parents can have a child. Okay. So one gene from here, another gene from here, and then the same gene. Oh, but first, me write, first let me write down. Sickle from this, abnormal gene from this parent, abnormal gene from this parent. Check who's, who's messaging. Okay. Then you have same gene from this and then with the other. So this is sickle. And this is normal, this gene with this gene, sickle, abnormal, normal, normal. Okay, so how many uh, okay, can have a child with sickle cell anemia? So this is going to be a child with sickle cell anemia because it has both abnormal. These two will be heterozygous. So they, they because it's co-dominant, they, they cannot be completely normal. They will have half of their red blood cells abnormal and half of them normal. And this is absolutely normal child. Okay, so the ratio is one is two. I don't know forget the ratio here, okay? Because I don't know how what to call them. Are they patients or not? I don't know. What's the answer at the back? 19.7. Yes, this is another way. The table form is another way. I think this is, you might find this easier. So you write the genotype of one parent of ver ver vertically. Oh, the camera went away okay it's 9 35 maybe we can do the questions in the next class okay let's do the questions in the next class uh, but tomorrow i will take physics for grade nine okay because i understand you guys have physics first on thursday so let's um finish physics and then biology we'll see later okay so i have completed this chapter only the questions are left okay is there any question 